Chapters twelve, thirteen, and fourteen of the Right Away by Gilbert Parker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter twelve: The Coming of Rosalie. Charlie Steele saw himself as he had been through the eyes of another. He saw the work that he had done in the carpentering shed and had no memory of it. The real Charlie Steele had been enveloped in oblivion for seven months. During that time a mild phantom of himself had wandered, as it were, in a somnambulistic dream, through the purliest of life, open-eyed but with the soul asleep, all idiosyncrasy laid aside, all acquired impressions and influences vanished, he had been walking in the world with no more complexity of mind than a newborn child, nothing intervening between the sight of the eyes and the original sense. Now, when the real Charlie Steele emerged again, the folds of mind and soul unrolling to the million-voiced creation and touched by the antenna of a various civilization, the phantom Charlie was gone once more into obscurity. The real Charlie could remember naught of the other, could feel naught, save as in the stirring industrious day one remembers that he has dreamed a strange dream the night before, and cannot recall it though the overpowering sense of it remains. He saw the work of his hands, the things he had made with adze and plane, with chisel and hammer, but nothing seemed familiar save the smell of the glue pot, which brought back in a cloudy impression curious unfamiliar feelings. Sights, sounds, motions passed in a confused way through his mind as the smell of the glue crept through his nostrils, and he struggled hard to remember, but no, seven months of his life were gone forever. Yet he knew and felt that a vast change had gone over him, had passed through him. While the soul had lain fallow, while the body had been growing back to childlike health again, and nature had been pouring into his sick senses her healing balm, while the medicants of peace and sleep and quiet labor had been having their way with him, he had been reorganized, renewed, flushed of the turgid silt of dissipation for his sins and weaknesses there had been no gall and vinegar to drink. As Charlie stood looking round the workshop, Joe entered, shaking the snow from his moccasined feet. "'The curé, Monsieur Lucelle, has come,' he said. Charlie turned, and, without a word, followed Joe into the house. There, standing at the window and looking down at the village beneath, was the curé. As Charlie entered, M. Lucelle came forward with outstretched hand. "'I am glad to see you well again, monsieur,' he said, and his cool thin hand held Charlie's for a moment as he looked at him benignly in the eye. With a kind of instinct as to the course he must henceforth pursue, Charlie replied simply, dropping his eyeglass as he met that clear soluble look of the priest, such a well of simplicity he had never before seen. Only naked eye could meet that naked eye, imperfect though his own sight was. "'It is good of you to feel so and to come and tell me so,' he answered quietly. "'I have been a great trouble, I know.' There was none of the old pose in his manner, none of the old cryptic quality in his words. "'We were anxious for your sake, and for the sake of your friends, monsieur.' Charlie evaded the question. "'I cannot easily repay your kindness and that of Joe Portugais, my good friend here,' he rejoined. "'Monsieur,' replied Joe, his face turned away, and his foot pushing the log in the fire. You have repaid it. Charlie shook his head. I am in a conspiracy of kindness, he said. It is all a mystery to me, for why should one expect such treatment from strangers, when besides all one can never make any real return, not even to pay for board and lodging? I was a stranger, and ye took me in, said the curé, smiling by no means sentimentally. So said the friend of the world. Charlie looked the curé steadily in the eyes. He was thinking how simply this man had said these things, as if, indeed, they were a part of his life, as though it were usual speech with him, a something that belonged, not an acquired language. There was the old impulse to ask a question, and he put the monocle to his eye, but his lips did not open, and the eyeglass fell again. He had seen familiarity with sacred names and things in the uneducated, an excited revivalist, worked up to a state of clairvoyant and conversational with the Creator. But he had never heard an educated man speak as this man did. 
At last Charlie said, "'Your brother, Portugais, tells me that your brother, the surgeon, has gone away. I should have liked to thank him, if no more. I have written him of your good recovery. He will be glad, I know. But my brother, from one standpoint, a human standpoint, had scruples. These I did not share, but they were strong in him, monsieur. Marcel asked himself. He stopped suddenly and looked towards Joe. Charlie saw the look and said quickly, "'Speak plainly. Portugais is my friend.' Joe turned slowly towards him, and a light seemed to come to his eyes, a shining something that resolved itself into a dog-like fondness, an utter obedience, a strange, intense gratitude. "'Marcel asked himself,' the curé continued, "'whether you would thank him for bringing you back to—to to life and memory. I fear he was trying to see what I should say. I fear so.' Marcel said, "'Suppose that he should curse me for it. Who knows what he would be brought back to? To what suffering and pain, perhaps?' Marcel said that. "'And you replied, Monsieur le Curé?' I replied that nature required you to answer that question for yourself, and whether bitterly or gladly, it was your duty to take up your life and live it out. Besides, it was not you alone that had to be considered. One does not live alone or die alone in this world. There were your friends to consider. And because I had no friends here, you were compelled to think for me, answered Charlie calmly. Truth is, it was not a question of my friends, for what I was during those seven months, or what I am now, can make no difference to them. He looked the curé in the eyes steadily, and as though he would convey his intentions without words. The curé understood. The habit of listening to the revelations of the human heart had given him something of that clairvoyance, which can only be pursued by the primitive mind, unvexed by complexity. It is, then, as though you had not come to life again? It is as though you had no past, monsieur? It is that, monsieur. Joe suddenly turned and left the room, for he had heard a step on the frosty snow without. You will remain here, monsieur, said the curé. I cannot tell. The curé had the bravery of simple souls with a duty to perform. He fastened his eyes on Charlie. Monsieur, is there any reason why you should not stay here? I ask it now, man to man, not as a priest of my people, but as man to man. Charlie did not answer for a moment. He was wondering how he should put his reply. But his look did not waver, and the curé saw the honesty of the gaze. At length he replied, If you mean, have I committed any crime which the law may punish? I answer no, monsieur. If you mean, have I robbed or killed or forged? or wronged a woman as men wrong women? No. These, I take, are the things that matter first. For the rest, you can think of me as badly as you will, or as well, for what I do henceforth is the only thing that really concerns the world, Monsieur le Curé. The Curé came forward and put out his hand with a kindly gesture. Monsieur, you have suffered, he said. Never, never at all, Monsieur. Never for a moment until I was dropped down here like a stone from a sling. I had life by the throat. Now it has me there. That is all. You are not a Catholic, monsieur? asked the priest, almost pleadingly, and as though the question had been much on his mind. No, monsieur. The curé made no rejoinder. If he was not a Catholic, what matter what he was? If he was not a Catholic, were he Buddhist, pagan, or Protestant? The position for them personally was the same. I am very sorry, he said gently. I might have helped you had you been a Catholic. The eyeglass came like lightning to the eye, and a caustic, questioning phrase was on the tongue, but Charlie stopped himself in time. For apart from all else, this priest had been his friend in calamity, had acted with a charming sensibility. The eyeglass troubled the curé, and the look on Charlie's face troubled him still more, but it passed, as Charlie said, in a voice as simple as the curé's own. You may still help me, as you have already done. I give you my word, too. Strange that he touched his lips with his tongue as he did in the old days, when his mind turned to Jean Jacolaire's saloon, that I will do nothing to cause regret for your humanity and, and Christian kindness. Again the tongue touched the lips. A wave of the old life had swept over him. The old thirst had rushed upon him. Perhaps it was the force of this feeling which made him add, with a curious energy, 
I give you my word, Monsieur le Curé. At that moment the door opened, and Joe entered. Monsieur, he said to Charlie, a registered parcel has come for you. It has been brought by the postmaster's daughter. She will give it to no one but yourself. Charlie's face paled, and the curé's was scarcely less pale. In Charlie's mind was the question, who had discovered his presence here? Was he not then to escape? Who should send him parcels through the post? The curé was perturbed. Was he then to know who this man was, his name and history? Was the story of his life now to be told? Charlie broke the silence. Tell the girl to come in. Instantly afterwards the postmaster's daughter entered. The look of the girl's face, at once delicate and rosy with health, almost put the question of the letter out of his mind for an instant. Her dark eyes met his as he came forward with outstretched hand. This is addressed, as you will see, to the sick man at the house of Joe Portugais at Vadrome Mountain. Are you that person, monsieur? she asked. As she handed the parcel, Charlie's eyes scanned her face quickly. How did this habitant girl come by this perfect French accent, this refined manner? He did not know the handwriting on the parcel. He hastily tore it open. Inside were a few dozen small packets. Here also was a sheet of paper. He opened and read it quickly. It said, Monsieur, I am not sure that you have recovered your memory and your health, and I am also not sure that in such case you will thank me for my work. If you think I have done you an injury, pray accept my profound apologies. Monsieur, you have been a drunkard. If you would reverse the record now, these powders, taken at opportune moments, will aid you. Monsieur, with every expression of my good will, and the hope that you will convey to me without reserve your feelings on this delicate matter, I append my address in Paris, and I have the honor to subscribe myself with high consideration, Monsieur, yours faithfully, Marcel Loisel. The others looked at him with varied feelings as he read. Curiosity, inquiry, expectation were common to them all, but with each was a different personal feeling. The cure's has been described. Joe Portugais' mind was asking if this meant that the man who had come into his life must now go out of it, and the girl was asking who was this mysterious man, like none she had ever seen or known. Without hesitation Charlie handed over the letter to the curé, who took it with surprise, read it with amazement, and handed it back with a flush on his face. "'Thank you,' said Charlie to the girl. "'It is good of you to bring it all this way. May I ask?' She is Mademoiselle Rosalie Evanthorel, said the curé, smiling. I am Charles Mallard, said Charlie. Thank you. I will go now, Monsieur Mallard, the girl said, lifting her eyes to his face. He bowed. As she turned and went towards the door, her eyes met his. She blushed. Wait, Mademoiselle, I will go back with you, said the curé kindly. He turned to Charlie and held out his hand. God be with you, Monsieur Charles, he said come and see me soon. Remembering that his brother had written that the man was a drunkard, his eyes had a look of pity. This was the man's own secret, and his. It was a way to the man's heart. He would use it. As the two went out of the door, the girl looked back. Charlie was putting the surgeon's letter into the fire, and did not see her. Yet she blushed again. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen: How Charlie Went Adventuring, and What He Found. A week passed. Charlie's life was running in a tiny circle, but his mind was compassing large revolutions. The events of the last few days had cut deep. His life had been turned upside down. All his predispositions had been suddenly brought to check. His habits turned upon the flank and routed. His mental postures flung into confusion. He had to start life again, but it could not be in the way of any previous travel of mind or body. The line of cleavage was sharp and wide, and the only connection with the past was in the long-reaching influence of evil habits, which crept from their coverts now and again, to mock him as his old self had mocked life, to mock him and to tempt him. Through seven months of healthy life for his body, while the brain and will were sleeping, the whole man had made long strides towards recreation. 
but with the renewal of will and mind the old weaknesses roused by memory began to emerge intermittently as water rises from a spring there was something terrible in this repetition of sensation the law of habit answering to a machine-like throbbing of memory as a kaleidoscope turning turning its pictures pass a certain point at fixed intervals an automatic recurrence he found himself at times touching his lips with his tongue and with this act came the dry throat the hot eye the restless hand feeling for a glass that eluded his fingers twice in one week did this fever search up in him and it caught him in those moments when exhausted by the struggle of his mind to adapt itself to the new conditions his senses were delicately susceptible visions of jacqueline's saloon came to his mind's eye with a singular separateness a new developed dual sense he saw himself standing in the summer heat looking over to the cool dark doorway of the saloon and he caught again the smell of the fresh-drawn beer he was conscious of watching himself do this and that of seeing himself move here and there he began to look upon charlie steele as a man he had known he charles millard had known while he had to suffer for what charlie steele had done then all at once as he was thinking and dreaming and seeing there would seize upon him the old appetite coincident with the seizure of his brain by the old sense of cynicism at its worst such a worst as had made him insult jake ho when the rough countryman was ready to take his part that wild night at the cote d'orion at such moments life became a conflict almost a terror for as yet he had not swung into line with the new order of things in truth there was no order of things for one life was behind him and the new one was not yet decided upon save that here he would stay here out of the world out of the game far from old associations cut off and to be forever cut off from all that he had ever known or seen or felt or loved loved when did he ever love if love was synonymous with unselfishness with the desire to give greater than the desire to get then he had never known love he realized now that he had given kathleen only what might be given across a dinner-table the sensuous tribute of a temperament passionate without true passion or faith or friendship kathleen had known that he gave her nothing worth having for in some meagre sense she knew what love was and had given it meagerly after her nature to another man preserving meanwhile the letter of the law respecting that bond which he had shamed by his excesses kathleen was now sitting at another man's table no probably at his own table his charlie steele's own table in his own house the house he had given her by deed of gift the day he died tom fairing was sitting where he used to sit talking across the table not as he used to talk looking into kathleen's face as he had never looked he was no more to them than a dark memory well why should i be more he asked himself i am dead if not buried they think me down among the fishes my game is done and when she gets older and understands life better kathleen will say poor charlie he might have been anything she'll be sure to say that some day for habit and memory go round in a circle and pass the same point again and again for me they take me by the throat he put up his hand as if to free his throat from a grip his tongue touched his lips his hands grew restless it comes back on me like a fit of ague this miserable thirst if i were within sight of jacqueline's saloon i should be drinking hard this minute but i'm here and his hand felt his pocket and he took out the powders the great surgeon had sent him he knew how did he know that i was a drunkard does a man carry in his face the tale he would not tell joe says i didn't talk of the past that i never had delirium that i never said a word to suggest who i was or where i came from then how did the doctor man know i suppose every particular habit carries its own signal and the expert knows the ciphers he opened the paper containing the powders and looked round for water then paused folded the paper up and put it in his pocket again he went over to the window and looked out his shoulders set square no 
"'No, no, not a speck on my tongue,' he said. "'What I can't do of my own will is not worth doing. It's too foolish to yield to the shadow of an old appetite. I play this game alone here in Chaudiere.' He looked out and down. The sweet sun of early spring was shining hard, and the snow was beginning to pack, to hang like a blanket on the branches, to lie like a soft coverlet over all the forest and the fields. Far away on the frozen river were saplings stuck up to show where the ice was safe, a long line of poles from shore to shore, where carrioles were hurrying across to the village. Being market-day, the place was alive with the cheerful commerce of the habitant. The bell of the parish church was ringing. The sound of it came up distantly and peacefully. Charlie drew a long breath, turned away to a pail of water, filled a dipper half full, and drank it off gaspingly. Then he returned to the window with a look of relief. "'That does it,' he said. "'The horrible thing is gone again, out of my brain and out of my throat.' As he stood there, Joe came up the hill with a bundle in his arms. Charlie watched him for a moment, half whimsically, half curiously. Yet he sighed once, too, as Portugais opened the door and came into the room. "'Well done, Joe,' said he. "'You have him?' "'Yes, monsieur. A good suit, and I believe they'll fit. Old Trudel says it's the best suit he's made in a year. I'm afraid he'll not make many more suits, old Trudel. He's very bad. When he goes there'll be no tailor. Ah, old Trudel will be missed for sure, monsieur. Joe spread the clothes out on the table. A coat, waistcoat, and trousers of fooled cloth, gray and bulky, and smelling of the loom and the tailor's iron. Charlie looked at them interestedly, then glanced at the clothes he had on the suit that had belonged to him last year. Grave clothes. He drew himself up as though rousing from a dream. "'Come, Joe, clear out, and you shall have your new habitant in a minute,' he said. Portugais left the room, and when he came back Charlie was dressed in a suit of grey fulled cloth. It was loose but comfortable, and save for the refined face, on which a beard was growing now, and the eyeglass he might easily have passed for a farmer. When he put on the dogskin fur cap and a small muffler round his neck, it was the costume of the habit in complete. Yet it was no disguise, for it was part of the life that Charles Mallard, once Charlie Steele, should lead henceforth. He turned to the door and opened it. "'Good-bye, Cordigay, he said. Joe was startled. "'Where are you going, monsieur?' "'To the village. "'What to do, monsieur?' "'Who knows? "'You will come back?' Joe asked anxiously. Before sundown, Joe. Good-bye. This was the first long walk he had taken since he had become himself again. The sweet, cold air, with a bracing wind in his face, gave peace to the nerves but now strained and fevered in the fight with appetite. His mind cleared, and he drank in the sunny air and the pungent smell of the balsams. His feet, like with moccasins, he even ran a distance, enjoying the glow from a fast-beating pulse. As he came into the high road, people passed him in carrioles and sleighs. Some eyed him curiously. What did he mean to do? What object had he in coming to the village? What did he expect? As he entered the village his pace slackened. He had no destination, no object. He was simply aware that his new life was beginning. He passed a little house on which was a sign, Narcisse Dauphin Notary. It gave him a curious feeling. It was the old life before him. Charles Mallard, notary? No, that was not for him. Everything that reminded him of the past, that brought him in touch with it, must be set aside. He moved on. Should he go to the curé? No, one thing at a time, and today he wanted his thoughts for himself. More people passed him and spoke of him to each other, though there was no coarse curiosity the habitant has manners. Presently he passed a low shop with a divided door. The lower half was closed, the upper open, and the winter sun was shining full into the room where a bright fire burned. Charlie looked up. Over the door was painted in straggling letters, Louis Trudel, Taylor. He looked inside. There, on a low table, bent over his work, with a needle in his hand, sat Louis Trudel, the tailor. Hearing footsteps feeling a shadow, he looked up. Charlie started at the look of the shrunken yellow face, for if ever death had set its seal, it was on that haggard parchment. 
The tailor's yellow eyes ran from Charlie's face to his clothes. "'I knew they'd fit,' he said with a snarl. "'Drove me hard, too.' Charlie had an inspiration. He opened the half-door and entered. "'Do you want help?' he said, fixing his eyes on the tailor's, steady and persistent. "'What's the good of wanting? I can't get it,' was the irritable reply as he uncrossed his legs. Charlie took the iron out of his hand. "'I'll press if you'll show me how,' he said. "'I don't want a fiddling ten minutes' help like that.' "'It isn't fiddling. I'm going to stay, if you'll think I'll do.' "'You are going to stop every day?' the old man's voice quavered a little. "'Precisely that.' Charlie wetted a seam with water, as he had often seen tailors do. He dropped the hot iron on the seam and sniffed with satisfaction. "'Who are you?' said the tailor. "'A man who wants work. The curé knows. It's all right. Shall I stay?' The tailor nodded and sat down with a color in his face. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Rosalie, Charlie, and the man the widow Plumenden jilted From the moment there came to the post office the letter addressed to the sick man at the house of Joe Portugais at Vadrome Mountain, Rosalie Evanturel dreamed dreams. Mystery, so fascinating a thing in all the experiences of life, took hold of her. The strange man in the lonely hut on the hill, the bandaged head, the keen, piercing blue eyes, the monocle, like a masked battery of the mind, leveled at her, all appealed to that life she lived apart from the people with whom she had daily commerce. Her world was a world of books and dreams, and simple practical duties of life. Most books were romance to her, for most were of a life to which she had not been educated. Even one or two purely Protestant books of missionary enterprise, found in a box in her dead mother's room, had had all the charms of poetry and adventure. It was all new, therefore all delightful, even when the Protestant sentiments shocked her as being not merely untrue, but hurting that aesthetic sense never remote from the mind of the devout Catholic. She had blushed when Monsieur had first looked at her in the hut on Vadrome Mountain, not because there was any soft sentiment about him in her heart, how could there be for a man she had but just seen, but because her feelings, her imagination, were all at high temperature, because the man compelled attention. The feeling sprang from a deep sensibility, a natural sense, not yet made incredulous by the ironies of life. These had never presented themselves to her in a country, in a parish, where people said of fortune and misfortune, happiness and sorrow, c'est le bon Dieu, always c'est le bon Dieu. In some sense it was a pity that she had brains above the ordinary, that she had had a good education and nice tastes. It was the cultivation of the primitive and idealistic mind which could not rationalize a sense of romance, of the altruistic, by knowledge of life. As she sat behind the post-office counter she read all sorts of books that came her way. When she learned English so as to read it almost as easily as she read French, her greatest joy was to pore over Shakespeare, with a heart full of wonder, and very often eyes full of tears, so near to the eyes of her race. Her imagination inhabited Chaudier with a different folk, living in homes very unlike these wide, sweeping roof structures, with double windows and clean scrub steps, tall doors and wide uncovered stoops. Her people, people of bright dreaming, were not quarrelsome or childish or merely traditional, like the habitants. They were picturesque and able and simple, doing good things in disguise, succoring distressed, yielding their lives without thought for a cause or a woman, and loving with an undying love. Charlie was of these people from the first instant she saw him. The curé, the advocate, and the seigneur were also of them, but placidly, unimportantly. The sick man at Joe Portugais's house came out of a mysterious distance. Something in his eyes said, I have seen, I have known, told her that when he spoke she would answer freely, that they were kinsfolk in some hidden way. Her nature was open and frank. She lived upon the housetops, as it were, going in and out of the lives of people of Chaudier with neighborly sympathy and understanding. Yet she knew that she was not one of them, and they knew poor as she was, in her veins flowed the blood of the old nobility of France. For this the curé could vouch. Her official position made her the servant of the public, 
and she did her duty with naturalness. She had been a figure in the parish ever since the day she returned from the convent at Quebec, and took her dead mother's place in the home in the parish. She had a quick temper, but there was not a cheerless note in her nature, and there was scarce a dog or a horse in the parish but knew her touch and responded to it. Squirrels ate out of her hand. She had even tamed two partridges, and she kept in her little garden a bear she had brought up from a cub. Her devotion to her crippled father was in keeping with her quick response to every incident of sorrow or joy in the parish, only modified by willful prejudices scarcely in keeping with her unselfishness. As Mrs. Flynn, the seigneur's Irish cook, said of her, "'Sure she's not made all of one piece, the darlin'. She'll wear like silk, but she's not linen for everybody's washin'.' And Mrs. Flynn knew a thing or two, as was conceded by all in Chaudier. No gossip was Mrs. Flynn, but she knew well what was going on in the parish, and she had strong views upon all subjects and a special interest in the welfare of two people in Chaudier. One of these was the seigneur, who, when her husband died, leaving behind him a name for wit and neighborliness and nothing else, proposed that she should come to be his cook. In spite of her protest that was fit for Teddy was not fit for a gentleman of quality, the seigneur had had his way never repenting of his choice. Mrs. Flynn's cooking was not her only good point. She had the rarest sense and unfailing spring of good nature. Life bubbled round her. It was she that had suggested the crippled M. Eventurel to the seigneur when the office of postmaster became vacant, and the seigneur had acted on her suggestion, henceforth taking greater interest in Rosalie. It was Mrs. Flynn who gave Rosalie information concerning Charlie's arrival at the shop of Louis Trudel, the tailor. The morning after Charlie came, Mrs. Flynn had called for a waistcoat of the seigneur, who was expected home from a visit to Quebec. She found Charlie standing at a table pressing seams, and her quick eye took in with knowledge and instinct. She was the one person, save Rosalie, who could always divert old Louis and this morning she pluckered his sour face with amusement by the story of the courtship of the widow Plamondon and Germain Boily, the horse-trader, whose greatest gift was animal training, and greatest weakness a fondness for widows, temporary and otherwise. Before she left the shop, with a stranger's smile answering to her nod, she had made up her mind that Charlie was a tailor by courtesy only. So she told Rosalie a few moments afterwards. "'Tis a man, darlin', that's seen the wide world. "'Tis hemispheres he knows, not perishes. "'What he's doin' here, I don't know. "'Where's he come from, I don't know. "'French or English, I don't know. "'But a gentleman born, I know. "'Tis no tailor, darlin', "'but tailorin' he'll do as aisy as he'll do a hundred other things any day. "'But how he slipped in here, and when he slipped in here, "'and what he's come for, and how long he's stayin', "'and meanin' well and doin' ill, I don't know, darling. I don't know. I don't think he'll do ill, Mrs. Flynn, said Rosalie in English. And if you haven't seen him, how do you know? asked Mrs. Flynn, taking a pinch of snuff. I have seen him, but not in the tailor shop. I saw him at Joe Portugais a fortnight ago. Easy, easy, darling. At Joe Portugais, that's a queer place for a stranger. Tis not with Joe's introduction I'd be coming to Chaudier. He comes with the curé's introduction. And how do you know that, darling? The curé was at Joe Portugais with Monsieur when I went there. You went there? To take him a letter, the stranger. What's his name, darling? The letter I took him was addressed to the sick man at Joe Portugais's house at Vadrome Mountain. Ah, then the curé knows. Tis some rich man come to get well and plays at being tailor. But why didn't the letter come to his name, I wonder now? That's what I wonder. Rosalie shook her head and looked reflectively through the window towards the tailor shop. How many times had ye seen him? Only once, answered Rosalie truthfully. She did not, however, tell Mrs. Flynn that she had thrice walked nearly to Vadrome Mountain in the hope of seeing him again, and that she had gone to her favorite resort, the rest of the flax beaters lying in the way of the river path from Vadrome Mountain, on the chance of his passing. She did not tell Mrs. Flynn that there had been scarcely a waking hour when she had not thought of him. "'What Portugais knows he'll not be tellin', said Mrs. Flynn after a moment, "'and tis no business of ours, is it, darling? 
sure there's joe coming out of the tailor's shop now they both looked out of the window and saw joe encounter filian lacasse the saddler and maximilian cour the baker the three stood in the middle of the street for a minute joe talking freely he was usually morose and taciturn but now he spoke as though eager to unburden his mind charlie and he had agreed upon what should be said to the people of chardier the sight of the confidences among the three was too much for mrs flynn she opened the door of the post office and called to joe like three crows standing there she said come in mademoiselle says come in and tell your tales here if they're fit to hear joe portugais who are you to say no when mademoiselle bids she added very soon afterwards joe was inside the post office telling his tale with the deliberation of a lesson learned by heart it's all right as mademoiselle knows he said the cure was there when mademoiselle brought a letter to monsieur mallard the cure knows all monsieur come to my house sick and he stayed there there is nothing like the pine trees and the junipers to cure some things he was with me very quiet some time the cure come and come he knows when monsieur got well he say i will not go from chardier i will stay i am poor and i will earn my bread here at first when he is getting well he is carpentering he makes cupboards and picture frames the cure has one of the cupboards in the sacristy the frames he puts on the stations of the cross in the church that's good enough for me said maximilian cour did he make them for nothing asked filian lacasse solemnly not one cent did he ask what's more he's working for louis trudel for nothing he come through the village yesterday he see louis old and sick on his bench and he sat down and go to work that's good enough for me said the saddler if a man work for the church for nothing he is a christian if he works for louis trudel for nothing he is a fool first class or a saint i wouldn't work for louis trudel if he gave me five dollars a day tiens the man that worked for louis trudel worked for the church for all old louis makes goes to the church in the end that is his will the notary knows said maximilian cour see there now interposed mrs flynn pointing across the street to the tailor shop look at that grocer man sticking in his head and there's magliore cadere and that pig of a barber moise mossan staring through the door and as she spoke the barber and his companion suddenly turned their faces to the street and started forward with startled explanations the grocer following they all ran out from the post office not far up the street a crowd was gathering rosalie locked the office door and followed the others quickly in front of the hotel trois couronne a painful thing was happening germain boily the horse trainer fresh from his disappointment with the widow Flamondon, had driven his tamed moose up to the troy Coron and had drunk enough whiskey to make him ill-tempered he had then begun to show off the animal but the savage instincts of the moose being aroused he had attacked his master charging with wide branching horns and striking with his feet boily was too drunk to fight intelligently he went down under the hoofs of the enraged animal as his huge boar hound always with him fastened on the moose's throat dragged into the ground and tore gaping wounds in his neck it was all the work of a moment people ran from the doorways and sidewalks but stayed at a comfortable distance until the moose was dragged down then they made to approach the insensible man before any one could reach him however the great hound with dripping fangs rushed to his master's body and standing over it showed his teeth savagely the hotel keeper approached but the bristles of the hound stood up he prepared to attack and the landlord drew back in haste then m dauphin the notary who had joined the crowd held out a hand coaxingly and with insinuating rhetoric drew a little nearer than the landlord had done but he retreated precipitously as the hound crouched back for a spring someone called for a gun and filian lacasse ran into a shop the animal had now settled down on his master's body his bloodshot eyes watching in menace the one chance seemed to be to shoot him and there must be no bungling lest his prostrate master suffer at the same time the crowd had melted away into the houses and were now standing at doorways and windows ready for instant retreat filian lacasse's gun was now at disposal but who would fire it joe portique was an expert shot and he reached out a hand for the weapon as he did so rosalie evanthorel cried 
wait oh wait before any one could interfere she moved along the open space to the mad beast speaking soothingly and calling his name the crowd held their breath a woman fainted sung wrung their hands and joe portugay with blanched face stood with gun half raised with assured kindness of voice and manner rosalie walked deliberately over to the hound at first the animal's bristles came up and he prepared to spring but murmuring to him she held out her hand and presently laid it on his huge head with a growl of subjection the dog drew from the body of his master and licked rosalie's fingers as she knelt beside boily and felt his heart she put her arm round the dog's neck and said to the crowd some one come only one ah yes you monsieur she said as charlie who had just arrived on the scene came forward only you if you can lift him take him to my house her arm still round the dog she talked to him as charlie came forward and lifting up the body of the little horse trainer drew him across his shoulder the hound at first resented the act but under rosalie's touch became quiet and followed at their heels towards the post-office licking the wounded man's hands as they hung down inside m evanturel's house the injured man was laid upon a couch charlie examined his wounds and finding them severe advised that the cure be sent for while he and joe portugais set about restoring him to consciousness joe had skill of a sort and his crude medicaments were efficacious when the cure came the injured man was handed over to his care and he arranged that in the evening boily should be removed to his house to await the arrival of the doctor from the next parish this was charlie's public introduction to the people of Chaudiere, and it was his second meeting with Rosalie and Van Turel. The incident brought him into immediate prominence. Before he left the post office, Filian Lacasse, Maximilian Cour, and Mrs. Flynn had given forth his history, as related by Joe Portugais. The village was agog with excitement. But attention was not centered on himself, for Rosalie's courage had set the parish talking. When the notary stood on the steps of the saddler's shop, and with fine rhetoric proposed a vote of admiration for the girl, the cheering could be heard inside the post-office, and it brought Mrs. Flynn outside. "'Tis for her the darlin' for Mademoiselle Rosalie they're splittin' their throats,' she said to Charlie as he was making his way from the sick man's room to the street door. "'Did you ever see such an eye and hand? That able beast that killed two injuns already, and all the men of the place sneakin' behind doors, and she walkin up cool as leaf in the mornin dew and quietin the devil's own did you ever see anything like it sir you that seen so much madam is it not touch of hand alone or voice alone answered charlie sure tis somethin kin in baste and maid your man and thin quite so madam simple like and understand what noah understood in that ark of his for talk to the base he must have explainin what was for them to do like that madam through for you sir tis as you say there's language more than tongue of man can speak but listen then to me her voice got lower for tis not the first time a thing like that the lady she is granddaughter of a seigneur and descended from nobility in france tis not the first time to be doing brave things just a slip of a girl she was three years ago after her mother died and she was back from convent a woman come to the parish and was took sick in the house of her brother from france she was smallpox they said at first twas no smallpox but plague got upon the seas alone she was in the house her brother left her alone the black-hearted coward the people wouldn't go near the place the cure was away alone the woman was poor soul who went who went and cared for her who do you think sir mademoiselle none other go tell mrs flynn she says to care for my father till i come back and away she went to the house of the plague a week she stayed and no one went near her alone she was with the woman in the plague laver be said the cure when he come back tis for the love of god god is with her laver be and pray for her says he and he went himself but she would not let him in tis my work she says tis god's work for me to do she says and the woman will live if tis god's will says she there's an agnes day on her breast says she go and pray says she pray the cure did and pray did we all but the woman died of the plague 
all alone did rosalie draw her to the grave on a stone boat down the lane and over the hill and into the churchyard and buried her with her own hands at night no one know until morning she did so it was and the burial over she went back and burned the house to the ground serve the villain right that laughed the sick woman alone in her own clothes she burned and put on the clothes i brought her with me own hand and for that thing she did the love of god in her heart is for witty flynn and curé and any other to forget sure the curé was for ever broken-hearted for that she was sick abed for days and could not go to the house when the woman died and say to rosalie let me in for her last hour but the word of rosalie sure twas as good as the words of a priest saving the curé prince wherever he may be this was the story of rosalie which mrs flynn told charlie as he stood at the street door of the post office when she had finished charlie went back into the room where rosalie sat beside the sick man's couch the hound at her feet she came forward surprised for he had bade her good-bye but a few minutes before may i sit and watch an hour longer mademoiselle he said you have your duties in the post office monsieur it is good of you she answered for two hours charlie watched her going in and out whispering directions to mrs flynn doing household duty bringing warmth in with her and leaving light behind her it was afternoon when he returned to his bench in the tailor's shop and was received by old louis trudel in peevish silence for an hour they worked in silence and then the tailor said a brave girl that we will work till nine to-night end of chapter fourteen recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com